At the dawn of the 1940s, Paris is a city of glamour, style and culture. Yet as war breaks out across Europe, Nazi forces overpower the French defences, and Parisians soon find their city overrun by the enemy. When the Germans invade France and defeat the French army so quickly, they've got all of France at their feet. A lot of people were very worried when the Germans arrived. People were scared. People didn't know exactly what was going to happen. And while the occupants of Paris struggle to adapt to this hostile environment, a serial killer uses the chaos to his own advantage. Posing as an undercover ally, he preys on those most desperate to flee persecution under the Nazi regime. It was a very cleverly, cunningly put together plan. He shamelessly, ruthlessly took advantage of the situation for his own gain. People disappeared and they really just never heard from him again. And they wouldn't go to the police because going to the police was going to the Germans. This was a splendid opportunity to murder these people. Nobody would look for them. This film uncovers the shocking crimes of Dr. Marcel Petiot, the psychopath who believes he has devised the perfect murder and the race against time to bring him to justice. France, 1940. Only 20 years since it had been the central battleground of the First World War, the nation is under threat once again. Following Germany's invasion of Poland, Hitler's Nazi forces have stormed through Denmark, Norway and Belgium, and now begin their offensive against France itself. And although the nation has bolstered its military and strengthened its defences since the last conflict, the ferocity of the Nazis' assault on the country's northern border is relentless. It came as a huge surprise. Within five weeks, the French army was completely obliterated. France was in a state of panic and chaos. You had 10 million people fleeing from the north to the south. This was the largest number of people moving in one go since the Bible. There was no communication. You couldn't phone anybody, you couldn't send letters. So France was really, really on its knees. With whole towns and villages devastated by the onslaught, the nation's government quickly falls apart. And this chaos provides an opportunity for an aging icon of France's past, Marshal Philippe Pétain. The Prime Minister resigned and was replaced by Marshal Pétain, who was this huge war leader from the First World War, a total hero of France. And Pétain and the people around him were all in favor of an armistice with Germany. They wanted the fighting to end. The military elites, the leading generals in 1940, they're very much supporters of French right-wing politics. For people like Marshal Pétain, the great hero of, of World War I, who is going to step up as the new premier and then cut this deal with the Germans, they see this as being uh, possibly a positive development, that the Germans are importing this very disciplined Nazi system, and France will adopt its own version of the Nazi system, join its place in what Hitler is calling the new order, and then France will be rebuilt under German tutelage. And Pétain sees this as a positive thing. And although this feeling is not widely shared among the French people themselves, on June 22nd, Pétain and France's military leaders meet with Hitler and formally surrender. As the Nazi occupation begins, the nation is immediately divided in two, with the German military controlling the north of the country and a free zone established in the south, known as Vichy France, left under the command of Marshal Pétain. Here, he instantly falls into step with Hitler's master plan and establishes the French state, an authoritarian regime operating out of the small spa town of Vichy. The country's capital, Paris, however, is under the Nazis' command and within days of the invasion, its landscape is radically transformed. The tricolore, the French national flag, was banned and replaced by the swastika. Paris was moved on to German time. You had Germans everywhere, German soldiers, but also auxiliary staff, particularly in the center and particularly around tourist 
sites. You had black and white signposts to help the Germans find their way around Paris. The Germans were everywhere. It was utter humiliation to the French. The French were very proud people, and to suddenly have your country taken over and be powerless in your own land and have despots reveling in the joys of, of your city was, was absolutely you know, horrifying to the French people. And Parisians are quickly cast into an uncertain, paranoid world, no longer able to distinguish between allies and enemies. French society is just utterly divided. There's no freedom of the press, there's no freedom of speech, everything's very heavily censored. People have to be very careful what they say. Because remember, not only are the Germans there in control, but they enlist this huge apparatus of collaborationists, as distinct from collaborators. Collaborators were just people that said, I'm going to go along to get along. The collaborationists were people who said, I'm going to make my future with the Germans. I'm going to hitch my wagon to the Nazi wagon. So you're not only just dodging Germans, you're dodging a lot of French bureaucrats and policemen employed by the Germans who are as keen as the Germans to get you. But some remain defiant. Despite the risks, French patriots form the resistance, an underground army that fights from the shadows to subvert German rule and aid the Allied war effort. Resistance is small at first, and people are uncertain what resistance is going to be. So lots of early resistors don't necessarily regard violence as part of what they're going to do. There is a resistance in Paris, and there are lots of different kinds of resistance. Uh, so you have a resistance revolving around intelligence, a resistance revolving around escape networks, a resistance revolving around provision of information and publication. Resistance was something few people gravitated towards early on, but of course, as the occupation went on, as people were able to see the kind of conditions that were affecting everyday life, more and more people decided to take a stand. As the resistance expands, the Nazis and the French state tighten their grip on the nation imprisoning or executing anyone with links to this underground army. And while this further intensifies the climate of fear and distrust, in Paris, the hostile environment creates the perfect hunting ground for a ruthless serial killer. And his presence goes undetected by the authorities until 1944, when a shocking discovery is made at the home of Dr. Marcel Petiot. In early March 1944, dirty, foul-smelling, greasy smoke was coming out of the chimney of a house on the Rue Le Sueur in the 16th arrondissement in Paris. And it continued for a couple of days, and on March 11th, uh, the weather conditions were such that the smoke was bottled into the street and was really annoying all of the neighbors. After five days, this one couple couldn't take the stink anymore. She was vomiting, they were ill, so he called the police. They found a note on the house's door about forwarding mail to Auxerre, giving the address in Auxerre. They asked next door, and another neighbor said, oh, well, the property was owned by Dr. Marcel Petio, who lived two miles away in, in Paris. They called Petio's number. Uh, he answered, and he said, have you gone in yet? And they said, no. And he said, well, wait right there. I'll be there in 15 minutes. They waited about a half an hour, and when nobody had arrived, they, they climbed up to a second floor window, uh, broke in, and traced the source of the, the smoke to the, the basement. They let their noses lead them to the basement, where they found bodies burning in the furnace of a water boiler. From the furnace stuck an arm, a human arm, with the fingers still on the arm. Inside the boiler, they could see a human head. On the floor surrounding the furnace are assorted rib cages, jaw bones, and large chunks of charred flesh from at least 10 victims. As the police inspect the building further, they discover a pit of quicklime, and within it, the remains of yet more bodies. Initially, they believe they have stumbled upon a secret Gestapo base. The corpses murdered resistance operatives. Yet as they cordon off the crime scene, a mysterious stranger appears. A man on a green bicycle rode up and identified himself as the brother of the owner of the house. 
The police escorted him inside, took him down to the basement, and he said, my God, my head might be at stake. And they weren't at all surprised by that. But he identified himself as a member of the resistance. He said, I have, I'm sure that you've notified the German authorities of this discovery, and uh, I have hundreds of resistance files back at my house that I have to destroy before the, the Germans can get their hands on it. There was a Gestapo office not far away, and the first thought that the police had was that these were dead Germans and collaborators, and that uh, this mysterious person on the green bicycle was, in fact, a, a resistant. So they let him go. For these French police officers on duty that night, it probably would have made a lot of sense for them, given the situation in Paris at that time, to encourage him to abscond. Their loyalty lay with the French, with the French police. They didn't want to be dealing with the Germans. But as the police continue to search the house, they discover photos of the building's owner and realize that the mysterious stranger was, in fact, Dr. Marcel Petiot himself. As they prepare a warrant for his arrest, Commissaire Georges Massou arrives at the crime scene to lead the investigation. Commissaire Massou was a 37-year veteran of the police judiciaire. He had well over 3,000 arrests to his name. He was very prominent. He was one of the models for Georges Simenon's character, Inspector Maigret. He was a senior most uh, investigator and immediately took charge of the Petio investigation. As Massou investigates the large urban mansion, he is struck by its state of total disrepair. Room after room is filled with discarded furniture, while ornate valuables and expensive artworks are left neglected, strewn about the floor. As he makes his way down to study the carnage in the basement, an officer arrives with a simple message from the Gestapo. Arrest Petio, dangerous lunatic. But Massou considers this further evidence that the doctor may well be a member of the resistance and he ignores the Germans' order. There was always a very, very uneasy uh, relationship between the, the French police and the Gestapo. When the Germans invaded France, the French police had the option of leaving their posts, but they were fearful of doing that because the German military police would have taken over. So they wanted to still administer justice, and certainly there were still crimes that needed to be punished by the, by the police. But they were always in the very awkward position that they might inadvertently arrest resistance, or they might be accused of collaboration. So it was a very, very difficult thing. The French police did their best to subvert any of the investigations that they thought were involved in resistance operations, uh, but they had to do so very cautiously. Although cautious of colluding with the Gestapo's operation, that night, Massou does issue an arrest warrant for Marcel Petiot. But when police arrive at the doctor's other Paris property, they find that both Petiot and his wife have already packed and fled. As a manhunt begins to find the pair, the human remains from the basement are taken to the police laboratory for analysis. Upon inspection, however, they offer very little in the way of evidence, with both the fingertips and faces expertly removed from the corpses, and with hundreds of bones to sift through, the forensic experts have their work cut out. There was a very well-known and flamboyant medical examiner, Dr. Albert Paul, who loved the press, and the press loved him because he made outrageous statements. Uh, he said that in the quick line they had found three garbage cans full of small bones. But there was no way to determine how any of the people had died. They were too badly decomposed or consumed by the line. One thing that did concern him was that the thighs of some of the legs had stab wounds in them, and they were very similar to some bodies that had been found floating in the Seine a year or so earlier, which also had stab wounds in the thighs. And the thing that particularly concerned Dr. Paul about that was, as a coroner, he said, sometime when you're doing an autopsy, when you're picking up another instrument, you don't put your scalpel down, you use the thigh as a pincushion. Dr. Paul's discovery suggests that the killer had medical training, further indicating Dr. Petio's involvement in the murders and Massou immediately turns his attention to the bodies found in the River Seine between 1942 and 1943, suspecting that they may be victims of the same killer. He finds that the dissected limbs of nine torsos had washed up on the shore, including those of an eight-year-old boy. As a full investigation begins in earnest, the papers across Paris and Auxerre report the macabre details of the Rue Le Sueur discovery and the manhunt for both Marcel Petiot and his wife, Georgette. For the citizens of occupied France, this horrific affair proves an engrossing distraction. People were intrigued. It was so gruesome. The press were able to sensationalize that. 
It raised a lot of questions. It raised questions about who did this? Was this really Patio or was it somebody else? Why did he do this? I think the fact that he was a doctor was an important factor in that period. But the doctor has a very high status. Pillar of society, man you can trust, and the very notion of a doctor is somebody who looks after us, who looks after people, cares for people, makes them well. And so this is a complete negation of the, what we traditionally think of as a doctor. And just as Massu's investigation has unearthed a link between Petiu and the River Seine bodies, a telegram from the Gestapo arrives that complicates matters. It reveals that the Nazis had arrested and interrogated Petio a year earlier, suspecting him of being a prominent member of the French resistance. This again suggests that the doctor is an underground operative. Yet a witness soon emerges to paint a far more disturbing picture of Petio's resistance activities. A couple of days after the discovery of the bodies on the Rue Le Sueur, the business partner of a Jewish furrier named Joachim Gushinov uh, came to Commissaire Massou and told him about the disappearance of Gushinov. Back in 1941, when the Germans were beginning to crack down more on Jews in Paris, uh, Gushinov, who was treated by, by Petio as a physician, uh, decided that he needed to escape from the country. So Petio told him that he could help him with that. He had an escape network. He was involved in the resistance organization. Petio told Gushinov that he would have to be vaccinated, he would do the vaccination, and then he would be taken across France to the Spanish border, into Spain, which was neutral, and then to a port in Africa to sail to Argentina. So Gushinov took one and a half million dollars worth of cash and silver and gold and diamonds and went with Petio and was never seen again. So the business partner, uh, when he had heard about the discovery at the Rue Le Sewer, went to Commissaire Massou and told him this story. And all of a sudden, it began to seem that, in fact, the bodies might be something even more sinister than they had originally expected, and that there might have been this escape network that, in fact, did not go to South America, but ended at the Rue Le Sewer. Checking the facts of this testimony, Massou discovers that the secret rendezvous where Petio met Gushinov was in the Rue Pergolaise, a street that intersects the Rue Le Soir. In the coming days, the investigation uncovers more and more details about Petio's escape network, and it becomes apparent that Gushinov was not the only desperate Parisian to look to the doctor for safe passage out of occupied France. People came, they phoned, they said, so-and-so had left, a friend of mine. She was going to go to, to a doctor to help her escape. I think it could be Dr. Petiu. So they had a list of people who they knew had been in contact with Petiu and who had disappeared. As the investigation identifies countless potential victims, Masu realizes that he is dealing with a devious, ruthless serial killer and his hunt for Marcel Petio now intensifies. Using the forwarding address found at the Rue Le Soir house as a guide, Massou sends his men to Auxerre, a town a hundred miles south of Paris, where Petio grew up. Speaking with the locals, the officers piece together a disturbing picture of the doctor's early life. His parents were postal workers, whose busy schedule forced them to send the young Marcel to live with his elderly aunt and her maid periodically from the age of two. With his father often absent from his life and with few friends as he grew up, Petio was a lonely, unstable child. I think we can certainly see signs of a troubled mind from very early on. He shows signs of being very clever, but also signs of all the origins that one might expect in someone who is going to become a full-blown psychopath in later life. A psychopath is somebody who doesn't have the same emotional responses to situations that most of us would. A psychopath is often described as lacking remorse, lacking empathy, 
And usually this fits with something that we call an instrumental use of other people. So a psychopath is willing to use other people to get what they want and not show any guilt, remorse or empathy with the people that they're using. People for them become a means to an end. And we know that those kind of traits usually exhibited in terms of cruelty to other people, cruelty to animals, delinquent behaviour, bullying, can be seen in kids as young as seven or nine years old. He impaled birds and insects on knitting needles. He stuck pins into the eyes of the little birds. He locked them into boxes, shoe boxes, and he didn't feed them. So he could sit watching them die of hunger. As he is enrolled into the school system, despite being a brilliant pupil, Petio's behavior becomes increasingly disruptive and dangerous. He behaved very badly in class. One day he went into the classroom with a gun, which he had taken from his father, and he fired bullets into the ceiling. His father thought it was rather funny. And he told his father that he did so because he wanted to brighten up a dull lesson. Marcel Petio is certainly a psychopath. He fulfills probably the majority of the criteria on the psychopathy checklist. When we think about why people become psychopaths, usually we think of it as an interaction between people's genetic heritage, the sort of the traits and the, the genotype that they've grown up with, and also the kind of environment that they exhibit those in. So I think in Petio's case, uh, he has quite an invalidating early environment. His parents palm him off with two local spinsters when he's quite young. He, he seems to struggle to engage with his father. However, I think because there's evidence of cruelty to animals from quite a young age, because of the bullying, the difficulties in school, I think it's probably fair to say that there's a mix of both genetic and environmental influences in the mix, that somebody else going through those same experiences that Petio did wouldn't necessarily have developed into a psychopath in the same way and become what is, I think, by most modern definitions, quite a sort of a high-level psychopath in Petio's case. But outside of his disciplinary record, Petio is a highly gifted pupil and he develops a genuine interest in medicine. Within a year of his graduation, the First World War erupts. With France its central battleground, he enlists in the hope of becoming a medic. His stay on the front line is short-lived, however. Transferred to a psychiatric unit following a nervous breakdown, here doctors decide that he should be kept under constant observation. Military psychiatrists examined him, and they found him insane. I have absolutely no confidence that that wasn't a full-blown act so that he could get back from the front and be nannied and nursed. Psychopaths can be so very, very convincing and know exactly what to say and do to obtain their objectives. For somebody like Petio, with quite psychopathic tendencies, this chance to see other people suffering and to understand a little bit about what suffering was, where it came from, and how to mimic it is really critical to our understanding of, I think, the rest of his development. Because psychopaths don't necessarily understand or appreciate or respond to human emotions in the same way. So what they do instead is something that we call pseudo-mentalizing. They think that they understand what emotions are and how other people experience them, and they learn to sort of do a kind of copycat of that. He was discharged as 40% mentally disabled, and he was put on a pension, and he received that disability pension until the day he died. This diagnosis doesn't put an end to Petio's ambitions. Still determined to pursue a career in medicine, upon leaving the army, he takes advantage of a new government initiative and enrolls at the University of Paris to become a doctor. At the end of the First World War, there was a program in France to accelerate the medical education of former soldiers, uh, where you could take eight months of classes and do two years of an internship. And after the First World War, with all the people who had been killed, they really needed to replenish the supply of physicians. So this accelerated program tried to get new doctors helping patients as quickly as possible. It was never established that he really was a doctor, that he really had a medical diploma. He was intelligent. He had spent many years in mental asylums. He learned a lot about illnesses 
about diagnosis. And that's what it was. He was not a doctor. In 1922, following his rapid graduation, the newly qualified doctor Marcel Petio travels to the small rural town of villeneuve sur yonne and establishes a medical practice. And apparently overcoming both his troubled childhood and his mental health issues, here he seems to turn a corner and emerges a new man. He was a charming person. Uh, he was devoted to his patients. Uh, he worked long hours. He treated poor people for free. Uh, he would stay open nights and open on Sundays if people couldn't come at any other time. He listened patiently to people. Some people said that they discovered after they left that they had spent more time talking about their lives with him listening attentively than they had spent uh, talking about their complaints. His patients absolutely adored him. Of course, a psychopath would be drawn to that sort of profession simply because it gives him unique access to power. He was revered by many of his patients as the man who would go the extra mile, the man who would open surgeries on Saturdays and Sundays and all of that. Um, pure superficial charm to gain access and to see what he could manipulate for his own gain. And his popularity enables Petio to quickly become a prominent figure in the local community. Ambitious, intelligent and committed, the young doctor is the talk of the town. And in 1926, he falls in love for the first time with a mysterious woman of far lower social standing. Her name was Louise, but the townspeople called her Louisette. One evening, he went to have dinner. Louise was the maid. She was 26. She didn't have a boyfriend. Nobody knew where she came from. Very soon, she was his lover. She went to live with him. But a doctor could not have a mistress who was a domestic. So they pretended she was his maid. All the people knew that she was not his maid. Yet this relationship soon exposes Marcel Petio's darkest instincts. Within months of moving in with him, Louisette confesses to her friends that she is pregnant. And then, overnight, she vanishes without a trace. Petio complains that his young lover has walked out on him. But days later, a discovery in the Yon River suggests a far more disturbing version of events. One Sunday, a bad smell rose from the river. The townspeople went to see what it was, and they found a trunk caught in bushes beside the river. And they opened it and they looked inside, and they found the headless body of a young woman. People immediately said it was Louisette. It's important to understand what, what this act means. A again, if we understand that Petio is a psychopath, psychopaths' relationships with other people are characterized by what we call multiple marital-type relationships. So these are relationships where the psychopath will go into a relationship, they will probably seek to get what they can out of it. That could be sex, it could be money, it could be some sort of sense of intimacy. And I think in Petio's case, intimacy has been something that he's been largely denied. But then the point will come where something becomes stuck and I think in this case, Louisette becomes pregnant. Petio is unable to reconcile this with his visions for himself. Perhaps he doesn't want to be a father, perhaps he just panics, realizes he needs to get out of the relationship, and I think calculates that the best way to do that is simply to, to kill Louisette Delavaux. Despite some locals raising concerns over Petio's role in the murder, due to its mutilated state, the body in the river cannot be identified, and the case runs cold. The doctor, meanwhile, has ambitious designs on an even more prominent role within the town. And only weeks after the discovery of the corpse, begins a campaign to become mayor of villeneuve sur yonne His election was a little bit funny. It occurred soon after the disappearance of Louisette Delavaux, and one dramatic moment was he dragged himself painfully up to the stage and said, I must confess that I am guilty of a very serious crime. And everybody gasped. And after a dramatic pause, he said, I stand accused of loving the people too much. He was elected with a landslide of 80%. He promised the people he would reform the town. Because after the Great War, 
France was almost destroyed. He said he will rebuild the town. And the people loved that. That's what the people wanted to hear. Having now risen to the very top of the local community, in 1927, Petio meets a new partner, Georgette, the daughter of a wealthy and influential landowner, and the couple marry soon after. Yet in his new role as mayor, Petio quickly begins to abuse his power, and over time, his kindly reputation unravels. There were still people in the town who supported him, who still thought he was wonderful, but not from the people who worked with him. He was dictatorial, and they suspected that he was stealing from the coffers. They called in an auditor. The auditor found that he had signed contracts with contractors who nobody had ever heard of. He paid a huge amount of the tunnel's money over to them for work which had never been done, for equipment the town hall had never received. In 1930, however, a far more serious crime is discovered on a cold winter evening when firemen are called to the local dairy. Smoke was pouring from the dairy complex. They found the dairy owner's house was on fire. On the kitchen floor lay the dairy owner's wife. Her head was bashed in. She had obviously been murdered. Upon investigation, the police discover that the property has been burgled, and rumors quickly circulate that the new mayor has been having an affair with Henriette de Bove, the murdered woman. And Petio had, in fact, been present on the night of the discovery. When the firemen were putting out the fire, Dr. and Mrs. Petio drove by in their, in their car. They slowed down and looked, and then continued on to go to a movie. Uh, a lot of the people in the town thought that it was really the place of not only the mayor of the town, but also of a physician to be at the site of, of this disaster, rather than going to, to a movie theater. There was one townsman, a Monsieur Fisco, I believe, who said that he thought he had seen Petio near the dairy at the time of the crime. Unfortunately, Mr. Fisco had, uh, had rheumatism, and he went to his doctor, Dr. Petio, who said that he had a wonderful new treatment for uh, rheumatism and gave him an injection. Three hours later, Mr. Fisco was dead. With no other witnesses to tie him to the murder, Petio once again avoids arrest. Yet when, soon after, he is found guilty of fraud and embezzlement, he is thrown out of office, his reputation in ruins. His career in villeneuve sur had just come to an end. He had lost his position as mayor. He had been dismissed as a, a councillor. Uh, public opinion was turning against him. He was a suspect, despite the lack of evidence in the, the murder, in two murders. Uh, so it was a good time to get out of town. And I think also he just had larger ambitions than a small town in the provinces. So the obvious thing was to move to Paris. In Paris, joined by his wife and infant son, Petio sets himself up with a small urban medical practice and looks to quickly revive his career and attract new clients. In Paris, he had a leaflet printed, which he delivered himself, and he left it with pharmacists, in nightclubs, in bars, and in brothels. He claimed he could cure gonorrhea. He claimed he had a method of painless childbirth and he claimed he could cure cancer. So the patients bored him. Despite his outlandish claims, over the next seven years, Petio remains on his best behavior, determined to make an impression in Parisian society. But in May 1940, everything changes. Hitler's war machine storms into France and overwhelms the Allied forces, and the French government quickly flees Paris. A mass exodus follows, the residents of the city desperate to avoid the enemy at their gates. When Nazi battalions march down the streets of Paris in June, they enter a ghost town, its inhabitants scattered across the countryside. Yet ever defiant, Petio himself remains in his apartment with his wife and their young son. The Parisians fled Paris. Petio stood at his window and he was appalled at their behavior. And he told his family 
they will not flee. And he also said they will not suffer because of the war. He will provide for them. As the doctor begins formulating plans to prosper in this new, uncertain world, the German authorities themselves look to contain the chaos in the city. The German military had a very clear view of what they wanted. They didn't want any trouble. They worked very hard to give the impression that nothing had really changed. And that's to reassure the Parisians who are there and to encourage people to return. And over time, a sense of normality is restored, with returning Parisians slowly growing accustomed to life under Nazi occupation. Yet the joint authoritarian rule of the Germans in the north and the Vichy government in the south soon makes life unbearable for one group in particular, France's Jewish community. Even before the occupation, there was a deep-rooted anti-Semitism within certain quarters of the nation's population, fueled by figures on the French far right. Now many of these figures have assumed power in Vichy, and emboldened by their alignment with the Nazis, the persecution begins. There were a lot of people on the far right in 1930s France who wanted to reduce the role of Jews and the role that Jews were playing in France. And Vichy offered them an opportunity to put some of these anti-Semitic ideas into practice. There was a great deal of anti-Semitism, a feeling that Jews ran the media, Jews ran the department stores that put smaller shops and artisans out of business. And so they are happy to begin kind of sidetracking Jews, kicking them out of government jobs, removing them from the police, removing them from the military. The Germans ordered all Jews in Paris to register at police stations. Pétain, for his part, issued a directive that Jews could no longer be in the higher echelons of the civil service, of the army, and that all Jewish teachers, university and school teachers, had to resign by the end of the year. And then as the, the occupation progresses, the measures against the Jews increase. Many in Paris's Jewish community begin to look for ways out of the country but this is strictly outlawed by both the German and French authorities. And to successfully escape, those fleeing would first have to cross over from the occupied zone into Vichy France itself. Their only hope lies with the resistance, the underground network of patriots operating in the shadows. These two zones on the French territory were split by what was called a demarcation line, a heavily guarded border which divided the French, physically divided the French territory, cut it down the middle, and was extremely difficult to cross. What came about was the creation of so-called escape networks. These were originally set up by people working with the Allies. It was very important to get servicemen or airmen who might have been shot down in Nazi-occupied France. These people needed to find their way back to the UK, back to London, via a neutral, neutral country, and Spain and Switzerland would have been the obvious choices. The escape routes were part of the resistance activities from the very start. There was an escape route which ran through Brittany and across the Channel. Others down to points on the Pyrenees, getting people into Spain, and then if necessary, down to Gibraltar or to Lisbon, and to get Across the demarcation line, you needed the help of someone called a passeur. It was someone who helped you pass through, get over the demarcation line, and it wasn't always easy, and they weren't always reliable. And this increasingly hostile environment provides Dr. Marcel Petiot with an opportunity to exploit those most in fear for their lives. Following the invasion, the Nazis have plundered France of its resources and manpower, and with produce scarce, Many Parisians have fallen on hard times. Yet since the start of the occupation, the doctor has thrived, enhancing his earnings by offering illegal abortions and selling narcotics to drug addicts. Enriched by these criminal activities, he is soon able to buy an enormous second home at 21 Rue Le Soir. And this property offers him the chance to devise a more brutal, cold-blooded scheme. In late 1941, he visits local barber Raoul Fourier, a man with connections in the Parisian underworld. Here, Petio concocts an elaborate story and puts his new plan into action. 
The Jew told Fourier that he's a resistance. He is the head of a resistance cell named Flytox. And Flytox had an escape network. So if they knew of anybody who wanted to flee from France and the Nazis, especially Jews, Flytox could help them. He said his undercover name was Dr. Eugène. Taken in by this tall tale, Fourier doesn't notice Petiot's simple methods in concocting the story. Flytox is the name of a popular insecticide, and Eugène, a French brand of hair product, both of which sit directly in the doctor's eye line on the shelves of the barbershop itself. Instead, Fourier is fascinated by the deal Petio is offering. For a minimum of 25,000 francs, he will provide false papers and vaccinations and take the escapees to a safe house where they will be met by a people smuggler. This individual will then take them into Spain and from here they will travel to Sanctuary in Argentina. He also told Fourier that the potential escapees should bring their most valuable possessions along. Watches, jewelry, cash, gold bullion. Petio offers Fourier a share of Flytox's fee if he can spread the word and help identify potential escapees. Fourier agrees and enlists his friend Edmund Pantar, a stage actor with similarly shady underworld connections, to aid in the search for customers. Within weeks, the pair provide Petio with his first set of exiles a gang of French criminals who have fallen foul of the Nazis. These include thief and pimp Jo Le Boxeur, his mistress Claudia Chamou, prostitute Josephine Grippe, and hardened criminal Adrien Le Basque. Between the end of 1941 and the beginning of 1942, eight of this criminal gang are met by Petio and taken to his house on the Rue Le Sueur. Here they receive their vaccinations, and afterwards, none of them are ever seen alive again. It was possible for him to really invite his victims to package themselves perfectly as victims. You had people who were desperate to escape. You asked them to take everything they owned and convert it into gold, jewels, and, and liquid cash to bring few possessions because you're gonna be traveling light. Not tell anybody where you're going. Don't bring any identification papers. Remove all the marking from your clothes. They made themselves into perfect, untraceable victims for him. In an occupied city, in which the Nazis were already imprisoning and executing Jews, criminals and partisans, those apparently departing to Argentina through Petio are never reported missing. Through his elaborate scheme, the doctor believes he has devised the perfect crime, one that will be endlessly repeatable. He's a very successful, charismatic con man and he convinces a lot of people. And he tells people what they want to hear, which is always what a good con man will do. He'll, he'll find out what you want to hear and then tell you. And they're not just anybody that he's fooling. I mean, some of the people who, who he's fooling were tough gangsters. Joe the Boxer, Adrian the Bass. And if you're fooling people like that, that's pretty skillful. One of the, the things that people maybe misunderstand a bit about psychopaths is how easily grifting comes to them, how, how easily they can find scams that people will be taken in by. If you really don't care in your heart of hearts what other people think of you, if you don't care about the possibility of being caught out for lying or being found out for saying something that you're not, then what's the incentive for you to tell the truth at any point to anyone? So psychopaths are excellent grifters because their stories can seem very, very complete, well fleshed out. That the scam in Petio's case, you know, there's clear, there's need for what he's providing. He's identified the, the victims very carefully. He's identified a cover. He's got accomplices who can help provide the victims to him. People who come to a psychopathic doctor seeking something that only he can provide and they're desperate and emotional and grateful, that probably marks them out as quite weak in his eyes and therefore makes it easy for him to justify disposing of them in such a sort of callous and, and, and horrific way. And just as Petio's murder network is set in motion, the Nazis' own war crimes intensify on a far larger scale. At the Von C conference in January 1942, the final solution is formally announced, a program to systematically exterminate Europe's Jewish population. As the Germans begin the construction of death camps in the east, they look to the Vichy government for help in deporting Jews out of France. 
On the condition that their power in the southern zone remains absolute, Pétain's government agrees to arrest and detain foreign Jews, transfer them to a Paris concentration camp, Drancy, and then send them to their deaths in Auschwitz. The first major roundup takes place in Paris on June 16, 1942, in which thousands of Jews are detained at the Winter Velodrome. These men, women and children are captured not by Nazi soldiers, but by the French police. The Vichyites are enlisted in removing the Jews of France, and to this day it's a, it's a source of great controversy. The relative ease with which the Vichyites surrendered the Jews of France to the gas chambers. Times had changed for Jews in France, for foreign Jews, people who had fled from their old countries, from Germany, from Poland, from wherever, thinking that France, the land of the Enlightenment, would protect them. And suddenly, they're seeing that it wasn't going to protect them. 13,152 Jewish people were taken in one fell swoop. So it didn't take long, therefore, given how many thousands of policemen were in Paris on the 16th of July, knocking on doors. The fact that there was so much chaos, the fact that busloads of Jewish families were being transported to the Veldiv Stadium. Parisians knew what was going on. They saw, they heard. The concierges knew what had happened to the families in their building. Any Jew who hadn't been taken at that point was terrified that they would be next. And this leads many Jews, with the necessary contacts and financial means, to frantically attempt to evacuate Paris. And one family who do have the money to flee are the Knellers, a German couple with a young son. Kurt and Margaret Kneller were German Jews who had left Germany in 1933 when Hitler came to power. On the first day of the roundup at the Velodrome d'Hiver, the Gestapo came to the Knellers' apartment. Uh, fortunately, they weren't at home at the time. Unfortunately, they decided to escape uh, using uh, Dr. Paccio's escape network. The Knellers were German Jews, Kurt, Greta, and little René. On that day of the roundup, they went to a friend who was not Jewish. They went to hide with her. They then told her that a very kind doctor, a saint of a man, is going to help them to escape France. They were never seen again. However, a couple of weeks later, uh, parts of bodies were found floating in the Seine, which included a man's head, uh, parts of a woman's body, and the vertically sectioned body of an eight-year-old boy. The Canella's bodies are the first of nine dissected cadavers the police discover in the River Seine over the coming months. Throughout 1942, more and more desperate Jews come to the doctor for help through his unwitting accomplices, the barber Raoul Fourier and the actor Edmund Pantar. And they all meet a similar end. These include Lena Wolf, her husband Maurice and sister-in-law Rachel, Dr. Paul Braunberger, and Gilbert Bash and five members of his extended family. As Petio murders, dissects, and dispatches victim after victim, the press will later claim that this killing spree is motivated by a vicious bloodlust. For the doctor, however, these horrific murders are simply a means to an end. There is a common misconception that psychopaths are necessarily sadists as well, but it's not the case at all. However, there does, I think with anyone who commits violent acts, that there always has to be something driving that. It could be survival, um, it could be uh, sadism, it could be a paraphilia, for example. And I think it's, it's actually quite hard for us to conceive of somebody who simply kills because it's an efficient way of getting money or because it's carrying out the end of a scam. And I think Petio then becomes a sort of slightly odd character because the killings are very, very efficient. They're painless, they use cyanide, which I think is probably one of the more expensive and potent ways of killing people at that point. He knows how he's going to dispose of the bodies. It's almost, it's funny, it has sort of echoes of Nazi Germany and the way in which this sort of very psychopathic organization simply destroys human life in order to advance a particular ideal. Petio has maybe a sort of slightly earthier human drive that he seems to want money, although it's not clear what he ever does with that. So I don't think there's any evidence that Petio is a sadist at all. In fact, the, the clinical nature of his, his killing is, is quite striking, and maybe one of the more disturbing aspects of the case, actually. 
But in April 1943, just as Petio is lining up more victims to invite to his slaughterhouse, convinced that his scheme is undetectable, the escape network is discovered by the authorities. Yet not by the French police officers investigating the body parts washing up on the banks of the Seine, but by the Gestapo. And the Nazis are not hunting a murderer, but instead take Petio's cover story at face value. An informant told the Germans that there was an escape organization out of a barbershop, and there was a mysterious doctor who, who they hadn't been able to identify who was really responsible for it. So the Gestapo went to the barbershop. They arrested Fourier and Pantard. They tortured these two. They very quickly gave Dr. Eugène's real name, his address, and even his telephone number. And like that, the murder network is shut down. Petio is dragged into Frayne prison and subjected to a brutal interrogation by Gestapo commissaire Robert Jotkum. Yet rather than come clean and explain his criminal scheme, in which he had been murdering the same people the Nazis themselves were hunting, the doctor sticks to his cover story and suffers for months at the hands of his captors. They tortured him for eight months. They beat him, they filed his teeth, they compressed his head in iron bands, trying to find out more about the escape network. Genuine resistance who were in prison with him said that he was the bravest uh, person they had ever seen, that he taunted the Germans, he ridiculed them, he laughed at them. They were in awe of his courage and dedication, and they believed that he was genuinely a resistant and fearless. It's interesting why when he's captured by the Gestapo that Petio holds to the line that he's a resistance fighter and that he has a network that he's pursuing. Uh, even when doing so would likely have saved him from torture by the Gestapo. You know, he's risking quite a, a severe end if the Gestapo think that he is really a resistance fighter. But I think the Gestapo take the wrong angle here, not that they would necessarily have known that by torturing him, because you can't really punish a psychopath for their behavior. It doesn't really work like that. So torturing isn't going to uh, encourage Petio to do anything different because psychopaths don't respond to punishment. It's not something that they really have the capacity to do in their brains. Despite his refusal to cooperate, in January 1944, the Gestapo surprisingly releases Marcel Petio, planning to monitor the doctor further on the outside. Yet fearful that his actual crimes will be discovered by the Germans, and with decomposing bodies still littering the floor of his Rue Le Sueur basement, Petio returns to dispose of the evidence. He calls his brother, Maurice, in Auxerre, and has him deliver 400 kilos of quicklime, then fires up his furnace and begins incinerating the remains. Yet rather than oversee the entire process, he leaves the property, the flesh still burning in the basement. He let the furnace burn. Why? Why did he do that? He, he, he seemed to have planned everything else so well. Why was he so stupid doing that? It really feels like, and this is actually quite typical of a psychopath, he sort of lost interest in, in, in that part of it. He's left with these corpses. What does he do with them? So he creates this sort of quasi-industrial place where he can burn them and then dissolve the bodies in quick climb as quickly as possible. But it sounds like it's messier uh, and, and less straightforward than he bargained for. And I think this is sort of the roots of his eventual uh, capture because he can't stop the filthy smoke coming out. He can't stop the smells of decomposition. So eventually the suspicions are raised and he's, he's found out. On March the 11th, 1944, the police are called to 21 Rue Le Sueur and the fateful discovery is made. With Petio and his wife nowhere to be found, Commissaire Georges Massou's manhunt gets underway. The note left on the door of the property leads them directly to the house of the doctor's brother, Maurice, in Auxerre. And within three days, they track him down and arrest him. They also discover Petio's wife, Georgette, at the Auxerre train station and she too is brought in for questioning. But the doctor himself proves more elusive, and the police's search is soon disrupted as the Second World War enters a decisive new stage. On June 6th, D-Day occurs, when the Allies invade the beaches of Normandy, and France is transformed into a battleground once again. And with the tables now turning, the resistance suddenly gains an influx of volunteers looking to join their ranks. There's lots of reasons why people after D-Day decided to join the resistance. Some people just felt a sudden urge to want to do something, not anything to kind of release themselves. But at the same time, some people 
really thought, I have not had a very good record for the last four years. Some of my actions have actually been quite shady. I better join the resistance now so that there's a good place for me in the new France. Once Vichy and the occupation ends, my resistance record is going to protect me. And although the motivations of these new recruits may be ambiguous, as the Allies fight their way across France, within rural towns and in cities countrywide, this expanded resistance joins the campaign. The D-Day invasion was at the beginning of June 1944, and it took about two months for the Allies to make their way across Normandy to Paris. As soon as the Allies landed, the resistance everywhere started blowing up bridges, blowing up trains, doing everything they could to make sure that the Germans couldn't send reinforcements. And in Paris, the resistance put up barriers in the street and began attacking the Germans and creating as much chaos as they possibly could. The liberation of Paris is accomplished by the Americans, British, and Canadians advancing from the Normandy beaches. The French resistance, though, is important in securing the city from, from within. The existence of large and growing numbers of resistors, who now are emboldened to become resistors by the turning of the tide, leads to the rapid pacification of Paris and its preservation as one of the jewels of civilization. The Parisians were out on the streets. They were kissing the GIs and giving them flowers and roses. It was the liberation. Paris was free. The occupation was over. With victory comes an immediate regime change. The Vichy government of collaborationists is toppled and power passes to General Charles de Gaulle. And his central aim is to unify the people of this fractured nation. At the liberation of France, it was really important for de Gaulle and for others at the top to make sure that France spoke with a single voice. And one of the ways it tried to do this was to say, we were a nation of resistors, a handful, a minuscule number of people in France collaborated. But the rest of you, the rest of France, even if we weren't acting as resistors, we believed in the resistance. So this myth of the resistance, something which was created at the liberation by de Gaulle, this was very powerful. While celebrations break out across the city, there are some who are far less jubilant. For those who aided the Germans, there are brutal repercussions, as angry Parisians set up people's courts and begin serving out harsh street justice. To bring order to the city, the resistance transforms into the French forces of the interior, the FFI, and they help police the liberated streets. But again, with motivations to join often dubious, this voluntary army becomes the perfect hiding place for fugitives looking to escape their past. Everybody who just wanted to help and be patriotic joined the FFI and collaborators when joined the FFI to hide. Petio joined the FFI and they made him a captain. Remarkably, undeterred by the extensive police operation that has been hunting him for months, Marcel Petio has never left Paris at all. Assuming a false identity, Captain Henri Valéry, the doctor has remained one step ahead of the investigators pursuing him and proving a master of disguise even played a role in the liberation of Paris itself. Yet Commissaire Massou, the detective in charge of the manhunt, sees an opportunity in newly liberated France. With the press free once again, he leaks a phony news story to a reporter, one that falsely exposes Petiot as a Nazi collaborator. Massou clearly knew that with somebody like Petiot, and he knew enough about him by then, that this was going to make him very angry which indeed it did. Within a few days, a letter from Marcel Petio reached the newspaper boasting of how he had been a resistant, how he had never collaborated, and so on. The police looked at the handwriting on the letter, and they knew from some of the internal information that, one, it suggested that Petio was still in Paris, and two, that he was probably serving in the French forces of the interior. So they sent samples of the handwriting around to officers in the French forces of the interior and asked them to compare them to the handwriting of all of the officers in the FFI stationed in Paris. The trap works. 
and within weeks, Petio is arrested at a Paris metro station and pulled in for interrogation. Heavily bearded and significantly more gaunt, on his person are several false documents, including the altered ration card of eight-year-old René Kneller. Protesting his innocence and claiming the murders of which he was accused were legitimate resistance executions, he is immediately jailed pending a trial. Here he waits for more than a year, the story disappearing from the headlines amidst the more substantial cases of high-level collaborators and Vichyites. Yet when he finally does go before a judge, the doctor comes to the forefront once again, pushing even the Nuremberg trials from the front pages. Exuding intelligence, passion and charisma, he maintains his innocence like a master showman. It was a sensational case. I mean, people had been following this in the newspapers for two years by then. And Petio had been so defiant and announced ahead of time that he was going to have fun, that this was going to be an entertaining trial. So nobody knew what was going to happen with it. It, it really, as one person said, was the theatrical event of the year. Suddenly he was famous, infamous, yes. But to him, he was famous. And he wasn't guilty, oh no. I think there was probably a very real danger that Petio could have walked free from that trial. I think it was, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna say it was poorly conducted because I, I just, I don't think that the, the justice system had ever seen anybody quite like Petio at that time. And certainly not in, in the context of, you know, a, a country just coming out of occupation. Most psychopaths usually have IQs probably in the region of around about 90, so significantly below the norm. It is quite rare to see somebody who's quite so articulate, quite so you know, professionally capable as, as Petio is. And to have somebody like that, who's also got the psychopathic features of being very charming, very glib, up to a point, it ceases to become about whether he's found guilty or not. He wants it to be the Marcel Petio show, and he wants to make sure that his voice is heard and his identity as a patriot is affirmed by the people in the courtroom. The prosecution has substantial material evidence to link the doctor to his alleged victims. At Petio's Rue Le Soeur home, the police have recovered a wealth of personal clothing, dresses, hats, shoes, and fur coats, belonging to Josephine Grippe, Jo Le Boxeur, Kurt and Margaret Kneller, and many others. Interrogation of the doctor's brother, Maurice Petio, has also led to the discovery of 49 suitcases in a large attic in Auxerre, all of which are sat, piled high, in the courtroom as evidence of this murder network. But Petio himself does not dispute this evidence and instead incorporates it into his own defense. Outside of the courtroom, although Petio is back on the front pages, the French public is no longer so certain of his guilt. The backstory puts him on the map. People now go, oh, let's have a look at him. What does he look like? People are looking for an answer and they get an answer, but it's an answer that is full of ambiguities. It isn't like Petio's on trial and then they decide he's insane and not fit to stand trial. No, we have a man who's standing up and putting forward a very elaborate story to defend himself. Petio was accused of 27 murders. He claimed that he had killed 63 people, but he said his were all justifiable homicides. For people like Gushinov, he said, I got him out of France. I took, he's in South America. South America is a big place. Go find him. For Joe the Boxer and uh, the, the pimps and collaborators, he said, yes, I killed him and I'm very proud of it. I should get a medal rather than being prosecuted. Why are you persecuting me this way? The ambiguity of Petio's defense, there is an echo with, with the ambiguity of, of the moment, if you like. There are going to be people in any situation where there's a change of regime, particularly where the regime is being replaced, is one that's involved collaboration with a foreign power. There's going to be a moment when people will say, actually, I'm going to pretend I was something else. I'm going to pretend I did things I didn't do, and I'm going to deny I did things that other people say I did do. Now, you have going to have that on a mass scale. People are going to tell themselves stories about what they did or didn't do. You have people who say they were in the resistance. Where's the evidence? in order to try and adapt to the new society. And Petio is living that out publicly in a very extreme form, I think. And Petio latches on to these ambiguities to his own advantage, knowing that his claims of being a persecuted resistance hero will play well to his audience. 
A psychopath is particularly well poised to exploit those kind of things because of a trait that we call pathological lying. A pathological liar doesn't have really a sort of grand truth to what they're saying. There isn't really, I think in Petio's mind, a grand truth about whether or not he is a resistance fighter, whether or not he has been gassing the Gestapo collaborators, whether he or not he is doing this for financial gains or not. It's all very murky, and because of that, he can simply emphasize the parts of which he wants to believe at any given time to any given responder, which means that you can't really catch a pathological liar out of a lie because they can always find another the way around it. It simply is left to the beholder to try and find a point, which I think in Petio's trial they do find, where simply the lie just isn't convincing anymore because the weight of evidence goes against him. No matter how engrossing his performance, nor how inconclusive the case against him, as the trial draws to a close, the jury swiftly delivers a verdict of guilty. While his wife, brother, and unwitting accomplices, Fourier and Pantar, are exonerated, Petio is sentenced to death still maintaining that he was acting only on orders as a genuine member of the resistance. On May 25, 1946, he is brought into the courtyard of Sante Prison and awaits his execution. As he stands beside the guillotine, he addresses the witnesses and tells them, look away, this won't be pretty. After the blade comes down, a court official looks at his severed head and later reports that Petio was smiling. You only have to see right at the last when he's facing the guillotine, and good riddance too, I might add, even that's a smiling affair. Turn away, this won't be pretty. It's psychopathic. With the war now over, and with the treacherous masterminds of the Vichy regime brought to justice, the years of occupation become an era many survivors choose to forget. And the unbelievable case of Dr. Marcel Petiot is also confined to that same dark chapter in France's history. One of the nation's most prolific and cold-hearted serial killers, who may never have become so infamous were it not for the war itself. In a time of sort of tragedy and, and death, this was almost a footnote of tragedy and death, which is the funny thing. I think Petio will probably remain a unique case because it just required such a precise set of circumstances for somebody who was quite psychopathic, yes, but also quite prone to violence and had this very callous attitude to his fellow men and women that they were simply chaff under the wheels for him to advance his career and his financial standings. And I don't think that if that was to happen today, there would be anything like the space for him to get away with that for so long. It is totally grotesque what he did. He shamelessly, ruthlessly took advantage of the situation for his own gain. And it is marvellous that finally justice came to him. Would he have become a serial killer if the war had never happened? I don't think so. The war gave him a fantastic opportunity to enrich himself. And to enrich himself, he had to kill. He enjoyed showing that he was better than everyone else. I mean, he could make other people believe anything. He could make people love him and adore him and respect him. He could take their things. He could take their lives. Everybody else was at his disposal. He was the one who was in supreme control of everything. My question is, why wasn't he resistant? I mean, he was, he was brave. He was intelligent. He was absolutely courageous and defiant of the Germans when they had him in a, in a prison. If he had wanted money, Germans and collaborators probably had more money than some of the poor refugees that he, in fact, killed. If he just liked killing people, there were plenty of Germans and collaborators to kill. He would have genuinely been admired by people. So why did he not do that? And the only explanation that I can come up with is that he only would have been fooling half the people. Whereas this way, he was fooling everybody.